including payment processing and check management in Sage 300, where we're going to be going over ORCID EFT and SOX check approvals. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the question box to the right side of your screen, and we can answer these as we go. With that in mind, I'd like to introduce Nancy, who will begin the presentation. Great. Thanks very much, Remington, and thank you to Jill, Holly, and Severin for your time today. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to spend a little bit of time with us. So I'm going to start with the SOX check approval product, and then uh, Rob, who's just joined us, will follow with the EFT, the ORCID EFT processing for you. So with the Tyrox check approval product, what we're doing here is giving you the ability to put some controls around the posting of the payment badge and the creation of checks in Sage 300. So we're not changing anything about the actual processing. Uh, what's going to happen is when someone creates a payment in Sage 300, the batch will be locked until an approval takes place. And then once the approval takes place, it will automatically unlock that batch and allow the checks to be printed and the batch to be posted. So with the setup of SOX check approval, there's just the one icon. So it's quite a simple product to install and set up. Um, the approvals will take place outside of Sage 300. So it'll be an external approval console. So those people responsible for doing approvals do not have to log into Sage 300 to do that approval. We're just going to create a SQL instance. And um, I'm just going to mute the lines here while we're talking, and then we can reopen them um, when we're going to take some questions. Um, so it's just a SQL instance that we're going to link to, and, and that's the external approval console. And then we're going to put in a name uh, and password. And what that does is um, when someone does the approval in the approval console, this username and password will be used to unlock the batch in accounts payable. So it's an instantaneous update. No additional process needs to be run. It's going to go in in the background and unlock that batch. You can have up to three different levels of approval. So um, you can specify how many levels of approval you would like. And then you would nominate the user at each level that's responsible for doing that approval. Now, if you have a multiple, a multi-approval level, I'm just going to say yes to this, then you can put a few additional parameters around that. So you can say all checks need to be approved at all levels or checks above a certain limit need to skip the first level and go directly to the second level. So you have a few different options there if you have a multi-layer approval process. Um, and if you wanted to nominate more than one person at any given level, what would happen is the request will go out to each person that's been nominated, and then as soon as one of those people does the approval, it's going to move on in the process. You have the ability to exclude certain types of payments from approval. So, um, you know, something like a visa charge, for example, petty cash, that sort of thing. You can base it on the payment codes that you set up in accounts payable. And um, you can, you know, certain types of payments don't need to be reviewed and approved. And since we're going to be looking at EFT, that's probably an example where you could say, because I'm doing a process with the EFT product, I don't need to review EFT type payments. I would rather review anything that a paper check is being cut for. So you have some flexibility as to what types of payments payments you want to force that approval around. Um, the data tab is just going to show you um, previous things that have gone for approval. So this would be like your audit log where you can view the database that it was drawn against, the batch and the date and the details of, of those batches. So this is like your history. Now, the database tab, this is related to that approval console that we're setting up the SQL instance for. So you would only ever come here when you initially set up the product, and you would just hit this Create button. And it's going to create the necessary tables in that SQL instance. So it's that simple to set up your database. 
Now on the installation tab, we're installing what we call a desktop menu control. And that's just a fancy way to say that we're taking out your standard uh, payment icons and we're replacing it with our own that puts the control around the posting of the batch and the printing of the checks. And we'll move on to that screen and you'll see it's the exact same screen you're currently familiar with. We've just added some additional features to that screen. Now, as far as the uh, payments going into the approval console, it's going to be a line by line. So each separate payment within that batch is going to appear separately within the approval console. So if you have a lot of payments that are going through, you could choose to send everything into the approval console as approved. And it's a tick box that signifies when something is approved. So you could send everything in as approved and then the user can review and just uncheck those things that they don't want to pay at that particular point in time. Or you can send everything in as unapproved and the user is going to have to activate that tick box for each payment to signify that they're approving it. Or you can say send those in uh, as approved if they're less than or equal to a set value and then you can set the value. So <clears throat> if you have a policy where you know, something like a $50 you don't really need to review, you can send those in as approved and then the user will just focus on those things that are unapproved. Um, on the email notifications, you do have email notification capability here. So you can send an email notification to each person or people uh, at each approval level. And then when that payment batch is finally approved, you can send an email back to the user that submitted it for approval and, um, and notify them that they can now go ahead and print those checks and post the payment batch. And we're using SMTP as the uh, email protocol here, so you would just put in those settings. So that's all there is to the setup of the SOX check approval. And so up in accounts payable, you'll see this extended payment batch list. So again, it's the same screen that you would be familiar with in Sage 300, but we've added this submit for approval button down here. Um, and that's really the only added feature. And this is how we're controlling, uh, locking that batch when it's first created and then unlocking it once it's been approved. So as far as entering the payment, nothing about that should change. You would just uh, create a new batch and we'll just call this uh, October 16. And I can go ahead and um, create my payments here. So I'm just going to create this for my vendor 1200. And that's just a message about the currency. Uh, what you're seeing on the right hand side is another product that we represent. It's called Document Management Link and uh, it's how you can view uh, backup documentation through this additional window. So I just want to mention that um, just so you're aware that it's not part of the SOX check approval. <clears throat> so down here I'm seeing my invoices related to my vendor 1200 and I went in earlier today and just created this one for October 16. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and say yes, <clears throat> pardon me, I, that I want to pay this invoice and add it to my payment batch. So in a real life scenario, you would go through and, and you would um, add a number of payments here. So let's actually add a second payment. Uh, let's just grab, uh, maybe we have some invoices for this coastal. There we go. So let's just grab this invoice here. I'm just going to change this amount to uh, a smaller amount and add that just so that we have more than one payment within our batch. <clears throat> so nothing about that really changes for you in terms of entering your payments. It's the same screen that you're familiar with there. Um, so here's where the difference lies though. If I were to try and print those checks or post the batch, it's telling me that it's an incorrect procedure, that it hasn't been approved. So I'm not able to print those checks. And um, you can see that the submit for approval button is here for me to submit that for approval. If I go to an earlier batch, you'll see that that button will dynamically change once this has been approved. So we'll go ahead and submit that for approval. 
Am I sure? Yes, I am. And you can see it's now been submitted for approval and the button is sitting as in progress. So anyone else coming into this payment screen will see that that uh, process is in progress at the moment. So as I mentioned, the approval console is going to sit out on your desktop. So if someone is traveling a lot and they wanted to run this <clears throat> off an iPad, for example, that could be done. So I'm going to log in as my general manager. Now, the life of a purchase, that's the name of my company database. If you have more than one Sage 300 company, you have an option. You can filter uh, multiple companies into the same approval console. So I would have my the name of my company database and then the batches within that company. And then if I had another company, it would have the, that company database and the batches for that company. So if you have a person responsible for doing approvals for multiple companies, you can filter them all into the same approval console. But if you have different people responsible for different companies, then you could have a separate approval console for each company to do the approvals. So here's our batch for October 16. Some information that we're going to provide here is like the name of the company that it's drawn against, the description of your payment batch, the overall total of that batch, as well as the currency. And then the batch number, the number of entries within that batch, the bank that it's drawn against. And here I can see the value that's approved and the value that's unapproved. So in my case, they all came in as unapproved. I could review this all and just click this button and it's going to go ahead and, and approve each of them. Or I could individually go down each line to do the approvals. Now down at the bottom, you'll see that there's some additional information related to uh, each payment. And there is also an integration with the ORCID document management link. So I don't have that integration running here, but if you are using the ORCID document management link, or if you have the Alltech doc link product, then this product will integrate with those where you would be able to see a copy of the invoice uh, that's the backup to this payment. But we'll go ahead and approve those and I'll just save that and then I can hit this approve button and move it along uh, through the process. Now it's been approved and it's instantaneously updated Sage 300. Um, if you have a multi multi-layer approval process, then you could hit the return button and you could return it to the person previous to you in the workflow, or you could return it all the way back to the initial user if there's a change that's required. But now if we go back into Sage 300, we'll see that that payment batch has now been uh, updated to approved. And now I can print those checks and post the payment batch. Um, so I'll open it up for questions in just a second, and then we'll move on to the EFT processing. Um, but just to quickly touch on that, so I'm going to say yes, they were printed, and now it's going to go ahead and post the batch. So Rob's going to show you all of the details for EFT, but I just want to show you these two products working together. Because um, what would happen once you've done the approvals around your payment batch, you would then move on to EFT and create your EFT file. So if you remember the number of our batch, let's just go back here and open up and remind ourselves what the batch. So it was payment uh, batch number 92. Uh, now when I go into EFT and I go to create my EFT file, you'll see that it brings up the last batch that was that was approved. And then you can just go ahead and create that EFT file. So the two products work quite well together. Um, within the settings of EFT, you can specify that you cannot generate the EFT file until that payment batch has been posted. And with the SOX check approval, you can ensure that it's been reviewed before it gets posted. So you can completely close the loop in terms of your payments and making sure that things have been reviewed prior to creating your EFT file. So with that, I will open it up for some questions and then I will pass it over to Rob to show you the EFT. 
So are there any questions related to the SOX check approval? I've unmuted all your lines. Okay, so what I will do then is I will make Rob the presenter and um, pass the baton to Rob. Thank you, Nancy, and good morning again, everyone. Thanks for your time this morning. We appreciate it very much. So as Nancy's just demonstrated, there are ways for you to build workflow approvals into the payment process within Sage 300. And then you've got the ability to generate your payment either as a check document or, or you can link that in with the EFT processing module to send payments to your vendors electronically. In order to do that, <clears throat> rather than creating a check, you would create an EFT file. And this file is based on the AP payment batch that you've created within the accounts payable module. Just to highlight though, we also integrate with the accounts receivable module. So if you're processing receipt batches or refund batches within accounts receivable, we also have the ability to upload those files to the bank. So if you pull money from a customer's account as well as sending money to a vendor's account, we handle both sides of the transactions. So this AP payment <clears throat> can be configured to either be posted or unposted, and that's part of our setup options. So we'll take a, a minute to go through some of these options that you have, because you'll see with AR and AP, the option setup is quite similar. To start with, we allow an EFT file creation to either be set up across a range of batches or one batch for every EFT file. So in the case where I say yes, I would be able to choose from a range of payment batches that I have set up in my accounts payable module and this would then allow me to be more selective in what I choose to pay at any one particular time. The next option is, do I allow unposted batches to be selected? <clears throat> now, best practices would suggest that you don't allow unposted batches to be the foundation for generating EFT files. And the reason for that, as some of you might be aware, is that if you make a change to an unposted batch in Sage 300, there's no record of that change being made unless you're using an audit logging tool to capture the change and who did the change and when that change was made. <clears throat> but in standard Sage 300, there is no way to track changes to an unposted batch. So we generally recommend that you say no to that setting and only allow posted batches, which then used in conjunction with Hyrox check approval forces the approval because you can't post the batch until that batch has been approved. The next option is whether or not you want to skip over vendors that are part of a payment batch and create the EFT file, or whether you want to display an error and abort the creation of that EFT file if you find a non-EFT vendor within that payment batch. Again, best practices would suggest that you create a separate payment batch for your EFT vendors and then a separate batch for your check vendors so that you would create the setting to display an error and abort the creation of the EFT file if for some reason you found a check vendor within the EFT payment batch. And the easiest way to do that is in your vendor setup within accounts payable, you have the option to create payment codes. And as you create your vendors, you can determine by selecting here on the processing page the payment code that you would like to apply to a particular vendor. So if you use the EFT payment code for your EFT vendors, that makes it easy when you're generating your payment batches to use the create payment batch function, which gives you the ability to specify certain criteria for who to include within a particular payment batch. So you can use payment code as one of the selection criteria to identify just your EFT vendors to be part of that payment batch. And then you'll be able to use EFT knowing that all of the vendors within a particular payment batch are based on the EFT payment code. And again, you're seeing document management link pop on the right-hand side here. 
as a way of you recording invoice transactions against vendors as you're choosing those vendors. So coming back to EFT then, we have our transactions where we're creating the EFT files off of an EFT payment code so that only the EFT vendors are part of the payment batch. And that's why we would choose the display and error. The next option is allowing selective payments from within a payment batch. And this is typically used in conjunction with using a range of payment batches, but it could also be used to make selective payments within just one payment batch. When I turn on this option, it will give me the ability to select entries individually from within the batches. And when I do that, I can open up a secondary window and be able to highlight the individual payments that I would like across a range of batches. So what this means is that you're not forced to always make payments in a consecutive order based on how they've been processed within accounts payable. I still have the option within EFT to make selective payments from across one batch or, in, or multiple batches in order to expedite payments for important vendors or just because of cash flow concerns, I'm only gonna pay our best vendors first and then leave the rest of the vendors to wait for a couple more days until our cash flow situation looks better. So allowing selective payments gives you a little bit of extra flexibility in choosing how and when to pay these vendors. Because depending on the bank that you're using and the file type, you might have to um, set up the payment to happen on the day that you actually want payment to be processed. In other cases, you can put a post uh, future date on the uh, payment file and the bank will let it sit for two or three days so you can post date those payments. But again, that will be based on the bank that you're using and the file type. Speaking of the file type, this is a very important aspect of configuring the EFT module. The file type essentially tells the system how to format the EFT file for processing by the bank. And what you'll see here is that there are a number of different file formats for each of the individual banks within Canada. So as you can see, if you're using uh, Scotiabank, there's a number of different formats, even for the same type of service, because the banks are constantly updating these files for additional security and different features that they're adding to these payment files. The other thing to note is that it's not just check payments that we're talking about. We can handle wire payments, as an example. We can do positive pay. Positive pay is where we're still producing paper-based checks, but we want to send a file of those check payments to the bank to verify what checks should be processed. And this is an extra step in terms of security and identity theft to ensure that only the vendors that you wish to pay are the vendors that are going to be paid. There's also other payment formats, such as PayPal, credit card, and other formats, depending on the bank that you're working with and the type of payment that you wish to make. The other thing to note here is that this is a global solution. So we have formats for banks all around the world. In fact, there's now over 650 different formats that we support through EFT. So if you're making payments overseas or to the United States, we have formats for all the different countries. And the key to, the, to understanding the format is what we call the specification. When you're trying to determine which format you should be using within Sage 300, there's a specification document that you can get from your bank or financial institution, which will give us the layout of the file that's required to meet the bank's format requirements. And this tells us which format to use within the system. Now, every once in a while, we get a, a specification for a format that we don't currently have in the software. And if that's the case, then we will generate a new file format for you at no charge, assuming you're running a current version of Sage 300, which as of today would be version 2020, version 2019, and version 2018. If you're running an older version and require us to create a file format, then there would be a charge for time and materials, which is typically three to four hours of time to create the format. So as you can see here again, though, we've got different formats for different banks and different payment types, depending on the kind of payment transaction you wish to conduct. Because we also do things like credit cards, but we're not a payment gateway. 
We're just simply processing the payment. So you would still need a merchant account with a credit card vendor in order to approve those payments. But I'm just dropping down through the list here. You can see we, go, we cover multiple countries, multiple formats, depending on what kind of payments you need to make. <clears throat> so those are the specifications that are part and parcel of determining the, um, the type of payments that you wish to make within the system. Also note that we can encrypt the bank account information. So as you're processing payments and generating what we call remittance advices, you can encrypt the information about the financial institution number, transit number, and account number, so that that information is protected and it maintains the privacy of this confidential information and adds an extra layer of security within the application. So you see here, we can also encrypt a vendor account number as well as your banking information. Now, the last thing that I'll touch in terms of the configuration is the email capability. Because you're sending electronic payment files to the bank, it only makes sense to be able to send email notifications to the vendors as you're generating these payment files. So the way that works is there is an advice format. There's actually three different formats that we give you within the system that you can use to print a hard copy of the remittance advice if you wish. And I'll just print this to screen so you get an idea of the layout of the remittance advice form, which again is just a crystal form that can be modified if you wish to change the layout or format or the content of the EFT remittance advice. But generally speaking, people would want to see who the vendor name is, their banking information, notice the account number, and financial institution number have been um, encrypted, and then payment reference, payment date, invoice number information with the amounts. And if you were paying more than one invoice, of course, you would see multiple invoices on the remittance advice. But because we're working with electronic payments, then rather than printing the hard copy and having to fold stuff and mail that to your vendor, you can choose to use the delivery method that's tied to the vendor customer, which in our case would be part of the EFT vendor setup or part of the vendor setup within accounts payable. So what we can do is we can em embed an email address at the EFT vendor level, which is where we're specifying their bank account information. Or you can do that within the AP vendor by, uh, sorry, that's the payment code. What I wanted was the vendor information here. If you choose delivery method email, then the system can pick up the email address on the address page. And if we choose contact email, it can pick up the email address on the contact page. So you have three different options as to which email address you want to use, whether it's tied to the EFT vendor or the AP vendor, depending on your preference. If there's email addresses in all three fields, it defaults to the primary email address, which in our case is the EFT vendor address. If it finds that this address field uh, for email is blank, then it would move to the contact email or the email on the address page. So that's how we create an entirely electronic payment process for you, where we not only send payment electronically, but we then email the report. And as part of the setup options, you can determine the email message that goes with that remittance advice. So you can set up your payment remittance and determine sorry, that's a payroll remittance. If it's an EFT payment, you can determine the uh, language in the body of the email and notice that we have variables for things like vendor contact, payment date, and things like that, that you can also pick up from the vendor master file. So now having talked about that, <clears throat> you will have to do some setup within the bank for EFT which will take the regular bank services information for your bank information and then attach the file type that you want to use based on the type of bank and transaction that you're conducting. But then you also specify a path to where you want that file located when you generate it. And then you would have someone else preferably to create a segregation of duties, upload that file to the bank website. 
And this avoids having to rekey that information into the bank website for electronic processing. And there are different date formats that you can use to identify these files with a unique numbering sequence or date and number sequence format. So those are the main setup options. There's a couple of other things I want to highlight here for you in terms of audit logging. There are periodic processes where you can run inquiries to look at different logs that the system is keeping to maintain the integrity of your payment process. The first log is an EFT creation log where every time we create an EFT file, again, that could be AP payments, AR receipts, AR refunds, then you've got the ability to date and timestamp when that file was created, the user within accounts payable or, or Stage 300 that generated that file, the bank against those, which those payments are being made, the file folder where the EFT file is stored, and the dollar value of the transactions within that file. You can also generate a report of this, but you can also just keep this log in the system, and you can query it based on batch number or date range. So that's one of the logs we keep, a record of all the EFT files that have been created. The other EFT log that's created is for your vendors or customers if you're doing AR receipt, AR refund. And what this is doing is logging the date and time when certain vendors were first set up in the system, which would be highlighted by the information in the new value column, or if any of that vendor information is changing, the old value and what the new value was changed to. So this again is something you can sort by vendor name and number or by date. And this will allow you to keep track of all the records that have been set, set up within the system or modified within the system. So we do keep audit logs to ensure the integrity of the data within the system. And there's also the ability under the options to have the ability to force vendor status to be inactive or entered when it's first created and then have someone else go in and approve that vendor for EFT purposes and change the status to active because the vendor status has to be active in order for a payment file to be created. So in order to create an extra level of security, EFT, because it's an, an SDK-based module, in other words, it's built using the same tools as the rest of Sage 300, we can create a security group within administrative services just for the EFT module, which will allow you to create a profile for users that will determine their access rights within EFT. So in some cases, you might want to nominate someone to view and approve unencrypted vendor bank account details or the person who wants to generate the EFT transactions. And again, we're recommending a segregation of duties either between the person who creates the payment batch in AP and the person who creates the EFT file or between the person who creates the EFT file and the person who uploads that file to the bank because, as you know, you would need an ID and a password to log into the bank website in order to grab this file and upload it to the bank. So these are ways that you can create segregation of duties and an extra layer of security by using the security groups within Stage 300 to nominate who can do what within the system. And lastly, just because we get these types of questions quite often around security, Another way to safeguard the system is through an environmental control, which would just simply be taking the journal from accounts payable payment and matching that with the transfer details report that we can generate for you within EFT. And then you would match that with the report coming back from the bank to verify that all of the payments produced within accounts payable were actually generated through the EFT file and that's what the bank actually processed. So that three-way match between accounts payable, EFT, and the bank ensures that all of the payments that were made were successfully processed. And that's what this transfer details report is showing you. A list of the vendors, the bank against which payments were withdrawn, the account number that was used to send payment to the vendor, and the fact that it was successfully completed, and the dollar amount that was paid, processed. 
So that ends the formal part of the presentation around EFT processing.